Hey, hey, hey. Happy Wednesday. Come on in. Pull up a chair. Gaming Gang Dispatch is in the air. <laughs> gang and welcome once again to the duct tape studios i'm jeff mackler your host here at the gaming gang dispatch brought to you by shockingly enough the gaming gang.com of which i happen to be the founder and editor-in-chief so welcome aboard tonight is wednesday march 27th 2024 this is live stream 1030 Eight. If you're not really familiar with the show, let me point out, super, super casual around here. We're certainly not engaged in anything along the lines of rocket surgery by any stretch of the imagination. Just hanging out, having fun, talking about the latest in tabletop gaming news. And then I will usually pontificate on things that are going on in the hobby. So tonight, I have a question. Is there more gatekeeping going on in our hobby right now today than ever before? We will tackle that a little bit later. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more you are not going to find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. And of course, this is a live stream, so that means there is chat available. It's not on screen. It's one of the ways I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. And I will mention, I have changed the chat settings. So it was that you needed to be a subscriber to the channel for at least 48 hours before you could take part in chat. It was get another safety net to keep away some of the more unusual commenters. But we're going to check it out. We'll see how it works. Now you have to be a subscriber, but you only have to be a subscriber for five minutes before you can take part in chat. So somebody you might be stumbling along and sees this stream going on, they can join in the conversation after five minutes. But I will mention, my chat moderators have to be on their toes. So I do know our good friend, the madman, will not be joining us tonight. He is one of our chat moderators because he is running games tonight. I believe another regular of ours, Kevin King, is also running some games. I wish I was playing some games tonight. But it's okay. We'll hang out. Don't feel like you're playing second fiddle. I'm just saying, I, I would have liked to have been playing some games tonight myself. But I'm not. I'm doing a show. <laughs> but I do believe, fingers crossed, that the lovely and talented Sarah D is hanging with us, maybe in the shadows, maybe hidden away in an alcove somewhere, just overseeing the proceedings. Wielding a band hammer. Yes. So if you are a newcomer to the channel, please behave. First out of the gate tonight is Kathy Evans. Gerilyn is with us. Uh, please send me that email once again, because I did not get an email regarding the contest. Otherwise, of course, you would have gotten that PDF. Semper Buffo is with us, as is W Forge. Perkins Dearborn is also hanging with the gang. So welcome, everybody. So we are going to continue the new format tonight. But I will mention, if you watched last night's show, last night's show ran about an hour, 45 minutes. That is not going to be typical. 
Plus, there will still be more interaction with chat than you saw last night, mainly because I was going through a list of 10 things and discussing those things, and then I would be like, oh, okay, let me talk about an OSR game. So that was throwing off the chat mojo a little bit. Not too much, but a little. So there will be more interaction here tonight. And yes, Sarah D is polishing her hammer. If I had a hammer, I'd have it the morning. W Forge says the madman's fortunate to play in weekly games. And I think he runs, it's every other Wednesday. I think it used to be East Texas University for Savage Worlds. I don't think that's what they're playing now. I think it's something different. I think it is a little bit different. Perkins Dearborn says in the past, they struggled to get players. They asked lots of people. Most sauces, nerds, geeks, weirdos. We're going to get to that. That's kind of going to touch it on the gatekeeping aspect of things. And we are going to talk about that after the news. So without further ado, let's jump on into the news because now available from Capstone Games is Anunnaki. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Dawn of the Gods. Here's the latest. Your ancient alien civilization is leaving its dying planet in search of a new homeland. That promised land is represented by Gaia which is home to the magnificent human civilization of Atlantis. I wonder if Patrick Duffy lives there. But beware, other houses, factions of your civilization also have the same goal, and only one will be able to dominate Gaia. Anunakai, Dawn of the Gods, is a 4X Euro game by Simone Luciani and Danilo Sabia set in an ancient dystopian past where mythology and science fiction come together. Each player represents a different house whose rulers are viewed by terrestrial populations as gods. Players build bases, recruit troops, embody gods, explore the territory, develop their own technology, sign trade contracts, defeat local dominions and other players' armies, trying to conquer Atlantis, which owns huge treasures. Different actions will provide a certain number of immediate victory points. Moreover, random setup goals will provide you with sizable victory point rewards at the end of the game based on specific conditions. In the end, the player with the most victory points, winner, winner, chicken dinner. In addition to having a strong dose of controllability, luck factor is minimal. Game features an innovative starred action selection system that confronts players with interesting choices. Players can reincarnate their gods by performing their actions in a precise sequence on pre-established paths of their starred player board, or they can give up some deities, jumping freely from one action to another of their board to choose from time to time the situationally best actions. Anunakai, Dawn of the Gods, is for one to four players, ages 13 and up, plays in around 120 minutes, and it does carry an MSRP of $99.99. And any car, any color, $99.99 here at Earl (laughs) Shab. I know, you got to be a certain age to understand that reference. Really have to be a certain age to understand that Patrick Duffy reference as well. Gotta say, this looks pretty hefty. Capstone Games isn't necessarily known for, you know, like really meaty games. This is looking like it probably is. It's got kind of a cool sort of vibe to it where the ancient gods are actually alien beings. Sweet. Uh, And they're all trying to take over Atlantis. So there you have it. (laughs) B. Horn and Martin7w are joining us in chat. Let's talk about some role-playing game news. Because arriving in July, following a successful Kickstarter run for Goodman Games, is X-Crawl Classics. Here's the scoop. 
Kidman Games is proud to present X Crawl Classics, the role playing game core rulebook, the exciting game of live streamed extreme dungeon crawling in X Crawl. Professional adventurers team up to challenge manufactured dungeons for fabulous prizes with the whole event streamed live on spell phones. x Classics is a complete role-playing game with new classes, spells, monsters, and more suitable for populating your x campaigns. Enjoy creating improbable encounters not found in a standard fantasy setting that players will never forget. Triumph over parachuting velociraptors, karate dragons, and more for fame and fortune. x Classics is 100% compatible with Dungeon Crawl Classics, meaning it's a snap to use material for one game in the other. Welcome to x a fantasy world where the most popular sport is live-streamed extreme dungeon crawling. Professional adventurers team up to challenge a dungeon judge or DJ, in a manufactured dungeon with the whole event streamed live on spell phones empire-wide. The DJ builds a dungeon inside an arena with all the classic elements, horrific monsters, lethal traps, enticing treasures, magical hazards, secret doors, puzzles, and more. The DJ forces strategic thinking by manufacturing improbable high-gear situations that simply cannot be discovered in a standard fantasy setting. War horses with trapped exploding saddles, hang gliding velociraptors. I thought they were parachuting. Now they're hang gliding. And those are some multi-talented velociraptors. Jello golems bursting through brick walls. Jello? Weren't they splat against? The... Okay, all right, I, I, okay. Not, I'm not thinking in the right mind space. And goblin go-kart races. The players crawl their way through the DJ's dungeon, winning battles, collecting fabulous prizes, and powering up with magic treasure while plugging their sponsors, posing for the camera, and taking selfies for the audience. Successful crawl teams become superstar influencers, rich on endorsement deals and riding the celebrity lifestyle. Unsuccessful crawlers die in the dungeon as yesterday's news, or if they're lucky, retire injured to a sideshow, living as a referee or backstage monster handler. Most importantly, x crawl is fun, monster slaying, sports car winning, crowd pumping, face on the cereal box, dungeon fun. The 360-page hardcover core rulebook is going to arrive in stores on July 19th. It's going to carry an MSRP of $59.99. And I will mention, if you go and you look at a variety of online retailers, they are going to tell you this is coming out anywhere from next month on the 15th, which taint happening duly, because it was only this month that the files got to the printer from Goodman Games. And others are saying, oh, it's all the way, like, the end of August. Well, according to ACD distribution, it is July 19th, and according to Amazon, Amazon will have it on July 20th. Fourth. So there you have it. It is coming in July. And I am very happy to see this. I will be the first to admit I missed this Kickstarter. I don't, I don't recall sharing a news piece for this Kickstarter. And usually with Goodman Games, i usually pretty good at stumbling across their news releases and things like that. So you know I talk about Goodman Games a good amount. In fact, last night we chatted a little bit about Dungeon Crawl Classics. And I'm very happy to see this because I remember when I first became aware of Goodman Games, I saw this as one of their games, X Crawl. And I thought it was really unusual that 
they had a game where it was not the most supported game that they've got, but that they had a game in their repertoire that did not have any compatibility with Dungeon Crawl Classics or later Mutant Crawl Classics. I thought that was really surprising. Well, the recent Kickstarter that was very successful almost hit a quarter of a million dollars, if I remember correctly. Well, that is going to put that to rest because X-Crawl Classics will be compatible with Dungeon Crawl Classics and, by an extension, Mutant Crawl Classics. So I think it would be kind of fun if you were running a Dungeon Crawl Classics campaign to kind of throw in like an X-Crawl Classics adventure, right? That, that your characters get transported to this world of X-Crawl. I think it would be pretty wild. I think it would be pretty, pretty cool. Arthur Hoffert is joining us in chat. I believe this might be a first-time visit for Arthur, so make yourself comfortable. Nathaniel Cares is with us tonight, too. And Fleming Heron has arrived. Fleming Heron is with us. He is also a chat moderator, so we've got a couple of chat moderators hanging out tonight. So there is some discussion going on about regular gaming groups. So Arthur says, oh, man, I got yelled at by a coworker because we were talking about consciousness and academic philosophy, and I used some big words. It wasn't vanity. I just wanted precision. How dare you? How dare you utilize a vocabulary that other people are too dense to understand? Man, no better. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's sad, isn't it? That for a lot of people out there, you have to kind of dummy down your thought process so that others around you can understand what you're trying to get across. It's weird. It's super weird. So speaking of weird, Arthur says, it's weird some people immediately make a snap judgment that assumes you have the worst intentions. Yeah, like you're just trying to lord over them with all them. Big $5 words, eh? <laughs> Sly Blue Demon's with us. Good to see you, Sly Blue Demon. And another good friend of the show, Kevin R. Smith, former reviewer for the Gaming Gang, is also popping on by tonight. All right, moving right along. Let's talk about saving some money. Because there is a new bundle of holding which has landed. It features the Ruins of Symborum. At least that's how I pronounce it, from Free League Publishing. And I have got the deets on the deal. Explorer! This new Ruins of Symborum 5e bundle presents, you guessed it, Ruins of Symborum, the 2021 Free League Publishing adaptation for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition and compatible systems of Symborum the 2016 tabletop fantasy role-playing game set in the primeval forest of Davakar. I think they could have structured that sentence a little better. <laughs> Inspired by Princess Mononoke and the Witcher computer games, Ruins of Symborum conjures a rich setting of ancient ruins and barbarian clans, iron-packed elven wardens, and blight beasts. Princes and rogues, treasure and corruption, all beautifully illustrated in full color. I must say, in my opinion, I think Symborum, and by extension, Ruins of Symborum, draws far more inspiration from The Witcher than Princess Mononoke. Although, it's a great anime. It's just, I, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. Ruins of Symborum is very kind of dark fairy tale. Princess Mononoke. I don't know. I don't see it. Hey, that's okay. Free League funded the Ruins of Symborum supplements and adventures in a big April 2021 Kickstarter campaign. Should also point out, we've got quite a few reviews of 
some boardroom products. In fact, Sammy's got quite a few on the way. She's knocking out the entire throne of thorns. I think that's what the campaign is called. It's a six-parter. She's on top of that. We're going to get all of those reviews out there. Anyway, building on the 5e open game license rules, these PDFs add new origins, backgrounds, classes, and approaches, subclasses, optional rules for troop play, advanced traps, pitched battles, ceremonial magic, and more, and 5e conversions of the amazing Davakar Bestiary. Now 5e players can explore this rich and nuanced dark forest setting where shadowy halls beneath the foliage conceal monsters and infectious corruption. And if you pay more than the threshold price of $30.71, you'll get the entire Game Master collection with five 5 compatible supplements worth an additional $95. For some reason, I must have missed transferring over the first level. I think the first level of this is $19.95, if I remember correctly. So it is not, you know, like, I think it's $19.95, and you get the uh, core rule book, and I think a couple of adventures. Anyway, if you pay the threshold price of, well, at the time it was $30.71, might be $30.75 now, you'll level up and get that entire Game Master collection, which includes the Game Master's Guide for the 5e rules, the 5e bestiary, the adventure compendium, the two adventure collection Call of the Dark, and the Ruins of Symborum 5e Game Master screen. The savings run through April 15th. 10% of your payment after gateway fees will be donated to Direct Relief. Sweet. This is a cool setting. If you are someone who likes kind of a dark, fairy tale vibe to your proceedings without being grimdark. This is not a grimdark setting because the reality is that the big bad destroyed most of the world, but they were defeated. So the various different species are rebuilding and They happen to be rebuilding into the forest of Davakar, which has all these ancient ruins and things like that. Definitely worth a peek. I will point out this isn't one of the best bundles I have seen for Symborum-related products. I mean, it's not bad. I mean, you are looking at probably about $140 worth of product for $31, so pretty good, but we're not talking humble bundled areas of savings, which I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. And I know we've got some more folks popping into chat. We've got uh, Tony Yurkides. I'm sure I butchered that name. With us in chat, welcome aboard. Jack Hanks is joining us again, as is Malwinius from York. Good to see you. Good to see all of you. Uh, Some discussion of some 5e burnout. See, that's not something I have to ever worry about. (laughs) Uh, Perkins Dearborn asks, does this have a Gene Wolfe feel? I haven't read a lot of Gene Wolfe, and it has been a lo- it's been decades. It's been at least 20 years since I read any Gene Wolfe. I will have to say, not really. That this does not really have, because if I remember right, Gene Wolfe's stories, his novels, always had kind of an, a religious undertow to them. I'm not saying that they were like major theme points, but they, he was a very, uh, if I remember correctly, 
He was a very staunch Catholic, I think. And that kind of flowed into his writings. I'm not saying anything negative about it. I'm just saying that there, there is kind of a, a religious kind of under, <laughs> you know what I mean. Try not to back myself into a corner here. And people be like, oh, Jeff's handing out some of the religious persecution I see. No. No, I am not. Gustavo says he's, is joining us from Portugal. Welcome aboard. I believe Gustavo's been with us before. I think I recognize that handle. So let's talk about some more savings. Because if Ruins of Samborum wasn't good enough, well, Humble Bundle is offering the best of Magpie games. And I've got the skinny on what really turns out to be a smashing deal. Tabletop adventures in the Avatar universe and beyond. Introduce your role-playing game group to new universes of adventure with this bundle from Magpie Games. Included is everything you need to play Avatar Legends based on the mega-hit animated franchise, including a physical edition of the Avatar Legends starter set. You'll also get rule books, source books, and adventures for Root, the role-playing game, based on the award-winning board game, and Bluebeard's Bride, a stirring and ambitious RPG inspired by the grim folktale. Get all these games and more, an RPG treasure trove of 30 books and supplements, and help support Child's Play with your purchase. Now, you can jump on for as little as $5, or you can go all on in... Get the entire collection of 29 PDFs and that physical Avatar Legends starter set. Of course, you do have to pay extra for shipping for a minimum donation of, wait for it, $35. You heard that correctly. All of that and the physical starter set, which has probably got to be running... $20 at least, 35 bucks. These savings will run through April 13th and your purchase once again will benefit Child's Play. So something that's not kind of mentioned in this real short blurb, because Humble Bundle doesn't, they don't carry on like Bundle of Holding does, right? If you go over to Humble Bundle, it's usually a paragraph or two and it's like, they just show you everything you're getting. I wanted to make sure that you did see that Our Last Hope is part of this, which I have always heard really good things about. Now, granted, that's been out for quite a while. But also, there are Masks, a new generation releases, part of this as well. And I have always heard really good things about that superhero role-playing game. So even though it's not mentioned in the cell sheets, essentially, there are either three or four PDFs for Masks, A New Generation. So I wanted to make sure to share that because this really is pretty much almost everything that Magpie Games currently offers in PDF. So there is that. So pretty sweet deal. Kevin R. Smith says, this looks like a cool deal, even though they actually have a physical copy of Root. I think there are three supplements for Root that are part of this deal as well. Kevin R. Smith says, I think you have to pay more than the 35 to get the physical product. Not what I saw, unless they've somehow changed something, because they were showing $35 for all 30 items at minimum of $30, $35, unless it's changed. So, but yeah, because I thought, wow, that's a rocking deal. But still, you can jump aboard for five bucks if you want. Perkins Dearborn says, Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun is set in a bleak, distant future influenced by Jack Vance's Dying Earth series. 
W. Forge mentions that they think Magpie, uh, the bundle actually offers five or six different campaign settings. Very cool. Very cool. Perkins Dearborn points out, if you like Howard and Jack Vance, you might also like Gene Wolfe's books. I would say more Jack Vance than Robert E. Howard. Just kind of. So there you go. Kevin R. Smith says they were wrong. What? Wait, what? Kevin R. Smith was wrong about something? That does not happen too often, folks. Said, uh, yes, $35 does get you the starter set on top of everything else. If you want everything but the physical starter set. Now, you will get the PDF of the starter set. You just don't get the physical starter set. Is $25. There you go. Very nice. So Kevin, Kevin says, so yes. It is an incredible deal. Arthur Hoford says they need to get into Jack Vance. Good stuff. I He is, well, if you're going to read The Dying Earth, it is kind of an acquired taste, I think, for some, because some folks think they're just going to jump in and start reading it, and it's, oh, well, fancy and magic. Well, sure, okay. So it's going to be like reading Dungeons and Dragons stories now. No, it is not. <laughs> and most of the pr protagonists in his stories, they're kind of anti-heroes. So if, if you want your main character to be heroic good guys, stay away from the, from the Kugel stories because <laughs> he's kind of a shit heel. Good stories, though. I like Jack Vance quite a bit. Final news piece of the night. Sign Nominee Publishing has released Diocese of Mund Freud in print and PDF. Here's what I know about this. Worlds Without Number release. Goblins creep through the chill pine forest and loop gurus carry out under the gibbous moon. Oh, borrowing that from Lovecraft, I see. Villagers shiver within the palisade. Only the midnight church bells to comfort them in the deep winter night. Cruel fay and grim beasts and fell pagan spears press in on them from every side. But God and the tales of their mighty heroes of old shall preserve them. This is Montfroid, a cold shore on the coast of Corund, or Corant. And the weak and the foolish linger only in sad tales. The Diocese of Montfreud is a gazetteer set in the latter earth of the worlds without number fantasy role-playing game. An isolated frontier province of a hard-pressed kingdom, Montfreud is a wild land of isolated villages and fearsome foes, with the ruins of two prior ages of settlement scattered amid forbidding pine forests and craggy hills. Its folk cling to their faith and the chances of their heroic past trusting in both to drive back their countless foes. Within the pages of this gav... Gav? Duh! Within the pages of this gazetteer, you'll find a complete campaign setting for novice adventurers with challenges and situations suitable for a band of first to third level heroes. Full details of a half dozen villages in the chief town of Castanou each with NPCs and problems for budding adventurers to encounter. GM help, such as Montreux's Bessieri, a local name table, pre-made retainers, and tips on dealing with crime, taxes, and other matters of interest to adventurers. Milan's End, a fully developed four-level beginner dungeon with GM tips on handling the actual running of the adventure. While the Diocese of Montfreud is set in the kingdom of Courant, mentioned in the Atlas of the Latter Earth, it's been built to fit neatly into any conveniently remote chunk of coastline in your own fantasy world. In the same vein, Milan's End has been fashioned to suit any location where an abandoned manor might be found. So sally forth into the wilds, benevolent reader, or I guess we'll say listener, whether playing Worlds Without Number or other old-school inspired games, the Diocese of Montfreud gives you everything you need 
to start a fresh campaign of youthful heroism, glorious deeds, and potential tragic endings. The 71-page softcover is print-on-demand, also includes the PDF, it is available over at Drive-Thru RPG for $24.99. We can grab just the PDF alone over as well for $14.99. Steve Bernier, Bernier, I'll take a guess, is with us saying it is Montfroy. The D is silent. Well, beats the hell out of me, man. I'm just sharing a news piece. <laughs> Says it means cold mount. Hey, I'm lucky I can speak the English language. Good luck with me mentioning other things. <laughs> Tessie Trekkie has joined us in chat. See anybody else popping on in here? Pete Strakulich is also with us as well for some discussion of Elric of Melnabane, which is how we used to pronounce it for years. And then it turns out it is pronounced Melnibane. I don't know. Spent, I guess, 30 years pronouncing it Melnabane. Maybe even longer than that. And then the audiobooks came out from Audible, and I picked them up. And all of a sudden, it's like, Melnibity. Like, what? Zoinks? Sounded kind of silly. <laughs> all right, that is it for the news tonight. Of course, I was talking about drive through RPG there at the end. Don't forget, the gaming gang, thus this batch, is affiliated with the One Bookshelf sites. So if you are going to visit drive through RPG or Dungeon Masters Guild, Storytellers Vault, or Game Vault, what have you, please stop by thegaminggang.com first. Click on one of our banner ads. That way, if you happen to make a purchase, I get a small portion of that sale. And all those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do add up and help keep the gaminggang.com around. Also, if you like this video, by all means, please give it a thumbs up. Ow, my eye! If you like the video, if you dig the channel, if you find the gaminggang.com to be a valuable resource, tell if you just like what we do. You can always stop on by paypal.me slash the gaming gang to make a small donation. Hell, you can buy me a two liter bottle of soda. Let me take a, another sip of soda here. Delicious. And of course, Joshua Edwards lately has stopped by and made some not small donations. Mind blowing. Much appreciated. In fact, I appreciate all of you out there who utilize the banner ads and or visit paypal.me. And I know we had a, a $20 super chat last night. Big thank you to that. Although I always point out it's probably a better idea to do the paypal.me slash the gaming gang because Google takes like 50% of that super chat. Thereabouts. Thereabouts. There are four lights. I don't know. I'm a little silly again today. It's kind of weird. It's like when I'm kind of bummed, when I get in front of the camera and that, I, I, it's like I have to go extra mile to make sure that it's like, all right, Got to make sure that I'm not set sail for adventure. Mysteries abound in the pirate town of Rumplank, but none as well. <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty weird. Uh, if you were watching last night, uh, no changes with Elliot's nephew, Paul. As far as I know, I have not heard anything. I haven't like, reached out because... 
his family's got enough things going on. They don't need me calling up, go, oh, what's going on? So, and we did go to the police station and fill out a police report today uh, for the uh, bogus check. <clears throat> so that has been done. But like I said, the, the bank is going to try to fuck my dad over. I, it's obvious that's the game plan that they've got. So it is going to be a slog to get that money back, even though, you know, it's so obvious. Even the police officer was like, seriously, this check got cashed? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, we had it. Okay. Yeah, we had it. Fleming Heron says, Google takes 30% from the super chat. <clears throat> yeah, thereabouts, because uh, they don't actually tell you because... I get a payout from the videos and that, yes. All those riches on a monthly basis. I, it's just, Super Chats are just included in it. They don't tell you anything. Perkins Dearborn says, Jeff, you sound chipper and full of chutzpah. That's me. In fact, chutzpah is my middle name. Jeffrey Chutzpah McAleer. It's on my birth certificate. All right. Anyway, we are going to talk tonight about if you feel, and of course, obviously, if I feel, there's more gatekeeping going on in our hobby now than ever before. Because this seems to be a hot button topic for some people. And we're going to talk about that in some detail. But first, it's time for a brief intermission. Hiya, hiya, hiya. They're shrimply delicious. Hiya, hiya, hiya. You'll go for that mouth-watering, taste-tempting, meaty shrimp mixture all wrapped up in a crispy noodle jacket. It's a treat you can't beat. So come on, join the folks that are getting fresh, crispy, flavo shrimp rolls now at the snack bar. They're shrimply delicious. And I raised two. <laughs> hey, Harry, you in? Sure, I'm in. Seems the Friday Night Poker Club has never seen anything like Pringles' newfangled potato chips. Get a load of this. Potato chips? In that thing? Airtight lid. Wow, they're made a new way. Man, that's a lot of chips. Yeah, and look, they're not broken. Come on, taste them. Great. Mmm, fresh, crunchy. All those chips inside. See, they fit in a stack, like poker chips. How about that? The canister keeps them from breaking. Really fresh, too. And this lid makes them stay fresh. You'll be simply amazed, too, when you discover Pringles' newfangled potato chips. As many chips as in a big bag, fresh, unbroken, stacked in a crush-proof, stale-proof canister. Pringles' newfangled potato chips. Yum, yum, this Wilkins Instant Coffee is delicious. And it's even better when it's mixed with boiling water. And now, Compax presents the story of Shrinkenstein. <laughs> One day, a mad scientist was in his laboratory trying to create a living monster. I'll make you come alive yet. He swore. All at once, it happened. Whoa! Yelled the monster. I'm alive! I'm frightful! I'm Shrinkenstein! And before the mad scientist could say, You're kidding. <laughs> Shrinkenstein was off to terrorize the countryside. <laughs> Not to speak of the cities and suburbs. Ah! Women screamed as they took the wash out of washers and dryers. Shrinkenstein was here. Strong men moaned as they attempted to get into shrunken underwear. Shrinkenstein was here. Babies turned blue in their too tight sleepers. Shrinkenstein was here. But courage. The mad scientist went sane and created... Packnit. 
Arch enemy of Shrinkenstein. Stop it! Stop it, Packnet! Begged Shrinkenstein as he shrank into a corner. No. But Packnet no. came closer no. and closer until... No. Shrinkenstein vanished in a puff of smoke. Where Shrinkenstein had stood appeared a Packnet seat. It said Packnet. Less than 1% length shrinkage by government standard test 7550, parentheses, CCC-T-191B, end parentheses. Meanwhile, back at the lab... Tests are always going on to make sure pack-knit underwear and sleepwear never shrink out of fit, even after machine drying. Kind of grabs you, doesn't it? So, according to Steve Bernier, those guys in that Pringles commercial are lying sons of bitches. Damn you! Unbroken chips, my ass! And Fleming Huron is trying to figure out what the hell was that commercial for at the end? What was that? I think you only begin to understand what it's for about a minute in? I believe it was a brand. Now, I, I might not even be right. I, I could be absolutely wrong on this, but I believe it was a brand of underwear that would not shrink. T-shirts and underwear. So that's what that was. It's like... Yeah, that commercial is like a minute, 20 seconds long. I don't know what you're trying to sell. It's like watching a Japanese commercial and not speaking Japanese, right? <laughs> so they're like, you just watch a commercial. I have seen stuff that are sort of like, what the fuck is, what? What the, what is this? I don't understand. <laughs> it can be pretty fun. It can be pretty funny. <laughs> Smoking Pots is with us. They were asking uh, for me to define gatekeeping, which is exactly what I'm going to do. Because I don't think many people understand the real definition of gatekeeping in this case. But before I do, I did see that Gerlin had pointed out that all of their uh, like gaming stuff is all digital because they lost all, all of their possessions. Seems like a couple of times, once in a fire and once because of the thing that won't be named. I guess we'll say the thing on the doorstep. That sucks. Uh, I, got, I will say, though, that I guarantee Gerwin probably now has the mindset of you know, this is just stuff. It's all just stuff. It doesn't, doesn't really matter in the great scheme of things. I kind of have an attitude like that, too, where it's like, okay, if all this stuff disappeared, I'd survive. <laughs> Wouldn't kill me. <laughs> okay, so tonight, my question is, and of course, people in chat, by all means, chime in as I see Doomed Colonist and Travis Williams are both with us in chat. By all means, chime in. And if you're watching this on Memorex, chime in in the chat, or not in the chat, in the comments. You can't chime in in chat if you're watching it after the fact. I swear, this is only diet soda. That's all this is. Sadly, it's not diet right. It's Walmart brand, cheapo diet, zero sugar, whatever it is. So I swear that's all that's in it. All right. So my question is, is there more gatekeeping going on in our hobby now than ever before? Now, I will point out they are not in chat tonight, but Matthew Constantine 
is one of our regulars who hangs out. They actually commented on last night's video because I brought this up and that this was going to be the topic for tonight. And it's a very detailed comment. And I would certainly recommend if Matthew watches this on Memorex, copy and paste that comment and put it on the comment section for this video. Because he goes into the same thing. Well, uh, but I don't think people understand gatekeeping. So as far as somebody wants to play at your table and you don't want them to play at your table, that is not gatekeeping. That's just you not wanting somebody to game at your table. That's not gatekeeping. Gatekeeping is when people who are part of a hobby, and it's, it happens in all fandom, everywhere. People who are part of fandom who want to keep other people out. So they go out of their way to just be unsocial or, uh, for an example, a lot of times if you went into a, a game store, especially women, women, oh my gosh. Even to this day, a woman walks into a game store and it's like, like, I've never seen such a thing before. Uh, or people just act creepy to, uh, to kind of make people feel uncomfortable so they don't feel welcome. It's, it's essentially trying to make people feel unwelcome in the hobby so that they decide that they're going to go elsewhere. So it's, it's people in fandom trying to influence others away from their hobby. And a lot of times it's, it comes from a place where people mistakenly think it's like, oh, wow, you know, I love this so much. You couldn't possibly understand my love for Star Wars. So don't even try. You're not welcome. Yeah, goofy shit like that. That's gatekeeping. Telling somebody, uh, no, we don't really want you playing at our table. We don't have any space at our table. Yeah, because normally people don't sit there just saying, no, nah, we don't want you. We'll say things like, oh, uh, yeah, it, it, this is just, if this is a game. It's, it's for five people. You can't really, yeah, can't really get another person in here. So on and so forth. So that is essentially your gatekeeping. Sarah M. is popping on into chat. I believe this is a first-time visit. Welcome aboard, Sarah. And Char Aznable is with us tonight. Good to see Chaz. Char. What, did I say Chaz? What the hell? I'm a bitch. I, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. So, <laughs> Pete Strakulich says diet tequila. Well, you know, if you uh, happen to be diabetic, tequila is the way to go. No sugar. I'm pre-diabetic. It's type two. But it's, it's stupid. Well, you're pre-diabetic. No, I got to do stage two stuff. Um, but I don't like tequila. I don't, I don't care for tequila at all. I'm, I like vodka. Vodka is my uh, alcohol of choice. So, as far as gatekeeping, there are a lot of people out there, and I'm going to tell you straight out, I am not accusing anyone of bullshitting their experiences being gatekept. I'm not doing that at all. I'm not gaslighting anybody. I guarantee people who tell stories about how they have experienced gatekeeping 
or being truthful that it happened. What I have to say is, in my experience, when I was a teenager, when I was in my 20s, we didn't see that. We didn't go out of our way to keep people out of our hobby. Because you got to remember, when I got into this, and no, I'm sorry, I don't remember when Pringles were invented I know I was alive, <laughs> but I don't remember it. But we didn't go out of our way. We didn't gatekeep. And we didn't see anybody gatekeeping. Now, of course, when we would go to like a game day or that's, I've told the story how in Oak Park, Illinois, it's like every six months there was this community center and they would have like kind of like a mini con. And it would be from the morning through the evening on Saturday and Sunday. And we saw, you know, women there, not a, not a ton, but nobody was there like, oh, what, what, are the, what are the girls doing here? Just like, I remember I've told you the story about the Dungeons and Dragons tournament we played in at one of these game weekends. And the main dungeon master was a, was a young woman. She was a girl, really. And it was her little brother who was running our table. And we didn't think anything of there being a, a female running Dungeons and Dragons. But you got to remember, we weren't big on gatekeeping because we were dorks. <laughs> so... You know, there's a reason there's that article out there that says the eight people who made Dungeons and Dragons cool are creating their own role-playing game, which I've mocked that article a few times now. But back in the day, back in the 80s, into the 90s, being a gamer wasn't cool. It was like, seriously? And... I've said it before, and I, I apologize if people out there take offense to me saying this, but Elliot and I and our friends, most of our friends, were very thankful that we didn't look like your typical gamers. So we could go do other things. But something else, that I think is far more prevalent these days than ever before in the past is how fractured we are as a society. And we see this all the time now where it's not just, oh, you don't like this? Well, then I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Now it's, oh, you don't believe exactly what I believe so get out of my face. And that, I think, is a major problem. And that's, you know, the hobby has always been fractured into these little factions. That's never going to change. But nowadays, we just, we're just in smaller and smaller and smaller factions. And as opposed to when I was younger, and... We were gaming on, you know, a weekly basis. Sometimes we spent the entire weekend playing games at somebody's house. And there might be eight of us spending the night over at, uh, say, for an example, my friend Tim Phelan's house. That was not unusual for us to be doing that for the weekend. But we, were, we would welcome anybody on in to play with us because we used to talk about it all the time. It was fresh blood fresh blood in, in our group, and we, we welcomed it. Now, I cannot say that if somebody who was, say, like, openly gay or who was, like, really creepy, because you know what I'm talking about there, had wanted to join our group, I don't know if we would have been all that welcoming. I do not know. I would hope that we would have tried to be inclusive. But as a group, I, I can't honestly tell you either way. 
but I think we would have would have been kind of like, yeah, well, you know, you know, come on, give it a shot. And then if they, you know, freaked somebody out, well, then we'd have to deal with that at some point in time. Uh, so I do believe that right now there is far more gatekeeping going on because even look at, look at how people approach fandom. And I know for some of you out there or some folks who will end up watching this, you know, after the fact, maybe if you're in your 20s, you obviously don't understand this because you weren't around for it. I'll well, add something else that kind of bothers me is that I will see young people talk about how there was all this gatekeeping going on back in the 80s, back in the late 70s. Oh, all this gatekeeping. And it's like, really? You weren't around for it. So how can you tell me that you know about all this gatekeeping? And once again, I am not trying to say that people who experienced these sorts of things, people actively trying to keep them away from the hobby. I'm not saying that that didn't happen. But come on, please. You know, it, it gets to the point where it's sort of like, really? You remember the, the man landing on the moon? Really? You were born in 2000? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, so let's see what's going on in chat here, and then we will pick this back up. Because there were a couple of comments last night, uh, uh, about last night's show, saying that uh, there was not a lot of interaction with chat. And as I pointed out earlier in the show, if you tuned in late, that was because I was going through like a list of 10 things. And then I was showing off various different OSR games. So, you know, normally there's far, far more interaction with chat. James Eck is with us tonight. Said that Pringles commercial gave them serious 1975, 76 vibes. That's probably right about when it, when it came out. Uh, early 70s, I think, is when Pringles arrived on the scene. And in fact, you'll notice in the Pringles commercial at the bottom, because I shared one the other, other night, uh, on the bottom, it says available in limited areas or something along those lines, <laughs> limited regions. So, Kevin R. Smith says, I think this is part of the growth of gaming and nerd culture. In the old days, there were no gamer nerds and anime nerds because there were so few nerd culture products. Well, I, I don't know if I'd say there were so few, but I think it, we didn't have such easy access to it. I mean, I remember late 80s, early 90s, a lot of people were into anime, but you had to go out of your way to go find it. You had to go to uh, a, you know, a theater someplace, and it was usually kind of an art house theater that, oh, hey, they're showing Akira. Sweet. That's how I saw Akira. That's how I saw Ghost in the Shell uh, at a, an art house. So I think there were people who were into this kind of stuff. Obviously, Star Trek. Obviously, Star Wars, once they came around. But we just have such easy access to it. And I think, in a lot of ways, we're also spoiled that we have so much at our fingertips. So I can't understand how people will say, I'm bored. Like, how are you bored? It's like there's like a thousand things you could be checking out or doing, maybe even walking outside the door. Hey, try that out for size. <laughs> That's a different experience there. Pete Draglich says, I love being a misfit. But the thing is, now the misfits are cool. I'm not saying I'm cool, because that's certainly not happening. But Smoke and Bot says, so now it is a micro version of cancel culture. It sort of is in certain ways. And we, we do see it. And I, I probably see it more than the people in chat because 
I tend to face various comments that get thrown at me that sometimes uh, get deleted. But I know I mentioned this last night. There are certain like old school Renaissance authors. There are a couple. One of them I do tend to share news about. The other I kind of don't. And I have had people just go ape shit on me just for sharing a news piece from one of them. But then on the flip side, I also get people from the other side of the aisle who get all pissed off when I share news pieces from creators who are gay or transgender or woke as well. Flaming Aaron says, now it's those who hate Watsy and everyone who doesn't play 5e. And I guess some people might play 5e. Yeah, there is a bit of that too, where it's sort of like, well, uh, you don't play Dungeons and Dragons? Away with the... But the thing is, those people who only play 5e D&D are missing out on so much out there. And uh, amazingly enough, they might find something that's far better than 5e D&D. But they uh, just don't want to do that. Char says, I don't mind politics and controversial subjects in my game. I just don't want real and current things brought up at my game. Travis Williams says, yeah, they can relate. People are shocked to find out they play tabletop role-playing games as they're a gym rat and don't look like they would fit that mold. Hey, let's... Perkins Dearborn says, I remember the moon landing and Nixon leaving office. I remember Nixon. The 1960s are a haze, probably in diapers in the mid-60s. I was born in 67, so October of 67. I have vague memories of a moon landing. I cannot tell you if it was the moon landing. I think it was because I was little. I was very little. Arthur says they like slow burn entertainment. Games like Ultima and Wizardry. Wow, those are last from the past. Where you have to write notes and draw maps. Chris Lundgren's with us. Good to see you, Chris. There's unfortunately a lot of gatekeeping with many groneyards in the historical miniatures community. Not just historical miniatures. A lot of Warhammer 40K folks. I can tell you a quick story when I kind of catch into uh, up with the comments here uh, of someone, a woman who worked for Games Workshop. So Chris says, uh, especially when it's modern historical game systems like Flames of War, etc. Char says, I hate the purity tests on both sides of the tabletop role-playing game scene. It's gross. I'm with you on that. I come from an age you do not have to agree with everything that I believe in. And we can get along. Do I want to be subjected to your diatribes about various things? Fuck no. But then again, I'm not going to subject them to my diatribes either. So, but yeah, I mean, I know people, I've gamed with people who voted for Donald Trump, which, I mean, a lot of people, it's sort of like, oh, they voted for Donald Trump? Oh, man, absolutely. No way I'd play a game with them. Well, the same thing. They voted for crooked Joe Biden? I don't want them at my fucking table. Nonsense like that. And uh, it's, you know, sometimes you, you got to start to wonder, where are these divisions really coming from? Because, you know, if we're divided, we're not united. But yes, as far as uh, a lot of miniatures gamers, a lot of grow yards, yes, a lot of gatekeeping there. A lot of gatekeeping back in the 90s-ish on historical board gamers, too. I did see that there was 
the Emperor's Headquarters, which was located in Chicago on Irving Park Road. And I spent a lot of time there. And that's also kind of an example of gatekeeping that I had seen, but I did not, like, engage in. Uh, Where, the you know, a woman's in the store. It was my fiancé at the time. And uh, a guy in the store just eyeballing her. And he was, he wasn't just scoping her, like, ooh, hey, sweet stuff, why don't you leave this bum? He was kind of mad dogging her, like, what are you doing here? And it was sort of like she was just with, I was buying some minis. I was buying some 15 millimeter American Civil War figures from Old Glory. But yes, there is, there is that. We see that take place. I, I got to be honest, though. I, I think there's less gatekeeping for historical gamers. Now, I'm not talking miniatures gamers, but historical board gamers because that hobby is grayed out. It really is. And they are looking for fresh blood. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. And it's something that's been talked about for decades now, the graying of the hobby. And we're actually seeing a graying of the hobby with a lot of the tabletop role-playing games of old, passing of James M. Ward. Uh, so we, we have had uh, Janelle Jacques. So we are seeing that. Uh, John Brunhaver's with us, as is Matthew Blackwell. Perkins Dearborn says, we really didn't talk much outside of the game at the table. There are a few old friends that they stay away from now, but everyone was welcome. Well, once again, remember, not having people at your game table is not gatekeeping. That's just your game table. That's your prerogative. Right, I always talk about how, you know, I try to be, everybody's welcome at my game table. Unless you're a dickhead. Then no, I don't want you at my, ga- at my game table. And if you were at my game table, I would no doubt ask you to leave if you were a dickhead. It is not unusual for when I'm running a game with people that I have not, really run RPGs for in the past, if they kind of just step right over the line, I put them in their place. I let them know right off the bat, hey, that's just, that's not sort of thing that we do around the table. And it's usually sex shit. It's like, oh, sorry. I don't play role-playing games to get my rocks off. I just don't. Not my style. So it looks like we got a really good chat going. Oh, things are gonna things are gonna come to a screeching halt because Stephen from Roll for Combat's with us. <laughs> good to see you, Stephen. Patrick Dolan is with us in chat. Said their sister and friend, born in 1968, tried to join their high school D and D club. The existing existing members, all boys, proceeded to murder their characters. She never played again. I don't blame her. Once again, I'm not saying that gatekeeping didn't exist. Not saying it at all. I'm just saying I think there's more of it now. And I know it's a lot of people out there all singing kumbaya about this hobby and then turning around and being like, I don't want that person I don't want that person, that person, no, nope, Uh uh-uh. I wonder what Stephen from Roll for Combat thinks. He says, so I'm not welcome at your game table? No, Stephen, you're a dickhead. Why would I want you at my... (laughs) I'm just teasing. Stephen knows I tease. I just kid around with them. Chris Lundgren says, Jeff, I have good friends that now go to Historic Con and see a lot of fresh, new, younger players. 
but the national chapter of the H the MGS has been very aggressive getting new young players into the hobby, right? Because if they don't, the hobby will not exist. And this is one of the reasons why you might see, as far as pricing on like war games, not necessarily GMT. I think GMT still holds the line pretty nicely as far as pricing. Yeah, it might be a little bit pricier for some games if you compare them to, say, just a Euro-style game, component-wise. But you will see other companies that it's kind of like, uh, so that's like a $30 game, and it's $90 because it's a war game, and it's because they just don't move enough units. So they have to price the game at $90 in order to make any sort of a profit on that print run which tends to be pretty small. All right. So, I find good barbecue to level any playing field. I'm not a barbecue fan. It's not uh, too much mess. The uh, risk reward isn't high enough for me. It's got (laughs) a... Char says, yeah, perverts be wild. Yeah, they can be wild, just not at my table. Kevin R. Smith says, yes, this topic thing seems to be working for Jeff. Well, the thing is, I don't know if I can come up with a topic every day. So I will tell you that tomorrow's topic, because I made mention of this yesterday, I am going to share a story about myself. And it is not gaming related. And I will try to make it a quick, story. But it is basically why you do not fuck with me. (laughs) Just just saying. Not saying you're going to get hurt physically. Doom Collins says the whole horny role players thing has always bewildered me. Yeah, I I think some of the oddball stories that I've heard over the years are probably stories. But then again, I mean, you know, I say it all the time. As long as no one gets physically hurt or their feelings hurt around your game table, you knock yourself out, you have a good time, whatever way you want. Just doesn't necessarily mean that's going to fly if you come by me. Uh, Stephen at Real Wolf comments is risk reward on barbecue. Yeah, the risk to my clothing. The mess for like little tiny pieces of meat. <sighs> Depending on what kind of barbecue it is, right? So it's like, you know, sometimes you see people eating barbecue and they're eating ribs and they, they almost look like hamsters, like trying to get all in the last of that meat off the bone, and they're just dripping in sauce. Nope, 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 nope. All right. So, Smoking Pot says, we have a rule at our table, don't be thin-skinned. I'm with you on that. Uh, What if everyone's a dickhead? Well, then guess what? That's going to be a table that probably gets along relatively well until the shit hits the fan, and then the shit will hit the fan. If they're all dickheads. Uh, Patrick Dolan is hanging with the gang. I understand the concern with cancel culture, in fact, discourse in the tabletop role-playing game space, even leading to boycotts. But I'm curious how people have seen it played out at the table. So once again, that's not really gatekeeping. Gatekeeping is keeping you out of the hobby, not away from your table. But, I mean, that seems to be what people are kind of gravitating towards during this conversation. And I completely understand it. Um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of weird. I think part of, part of it, and you can tell me if you think I'm way off base on this, but I think part of it is the concept that many people have. And it's not just 
younger people. This is everybody. Not, okay, it's not everybody, but it's all age ranges. Where there is this concept that because simply I exist, I deserve certain things. And I'm not talking about you deserve, you know, food in your belly, roof over your head, you know, heat in the winter. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how come I don't have a PlayStation 5? I deserve a PlayStation 5. I should have a PlayStation 5. And it's like, well, you can have a PlayStation 5 if you purchase a PlayStation 5. You know, I come from an era where, well, thankfully, I was never one of these people who was like, oh, I got a credit card. Well, shit, uh, that gives me $20,000. I can get $20,000 worth of stuff. No. I tried to stay with the, if I can't afford it, to buy it in, with cash, I'm not getting it. I still kind of abide by that, probably more so than before. But there are a lot of people out there who, you know, well, I want this, thus I should be able to, to have it. And I know people who are my dad's age, my dad's 87, who think this way too. They go, oh, well, you know, oh, how come this show is on Paramount Plus? I don't have Paramount Plus. I want to be able to see this show. I don't think it's fair. It's, it's kind of like, uh, but you do realize Paramount Plus isn't aimed at you. It's like, I try to explain that to people all the time. Well, I want this really cool, well, what's kind of like PlayStation 5. I want a PlayStation 5. I can't afford a PlayStation 5, but I want it. I deserve it. I should have it. Well, maybe the PlayStation 5 isn't for you. I mean, if you can't afford to buy it, it's not for you. And yes, I come from an era where it was like, man, I, I sure would like to have that, but I can't have that. So I guess I'll just deal with it. Sort of like, yes, play me here. I says, life isn't fair. Suck it up. And I think part of the problem, too, when it comes to younger people is that they've been brought up thinking that they can do no wrong. That, oh, mom and dad are like, oh, you're, you're going to be president of the United States one day. And then they're 25 years old asking you if you want fries with that. And they have a hard time dealing with it because no one informed them that life is not easy. And the reality is there are very few people in this world who give a fuck about you. <laughs> you know, it's just the reality. But I think part of this whole people get upset when I talk about the gatekeeping. See, there is a, a point to this. Is that they're just so used to being, you know, coddled. Or just sitting there being like, oh, well, I, I, I want to play in that game at that table. I want to play in Flaming Heron's game. How come I can't play in Flaming Heron's game? Flaming Heron says I can't play in their game. Flaming Heron is gatekeeping me. I think that's some of it, too. Arthur says it's like the munchkin card. Bribe the dungeon master with food. I like munchkin. Uh, the company itself hates me, but I do like Munchkin. <laughs> Stephen from Roll for Combat says, Jeff, you do deserve a PlayStation 5. You get a PlayStation 5. You get a PlayStation 5. You get a PlayStation 5. Uh, you don't. I'm sorry. All right, we're going to wrap this up. But all in all, I do think that when people think of gatekeeping, and this is why the question was, is there more gatekeeping going on than ever before? It's because people think of gatekeeping as you're not welcome at my table. 
as opposed to you're not welcome in my hobby. All right. Hey, so Rogue Thinker is with us in chat. Rogue Thinker just, I, they must have like a, an alarm on their phone that says, Jeff's getting ready to wrap up the show. I think I'll tune in. Always pops in at the end. Sometimes I don't even get a chance to say hello. Keith the Gamer Geek is popping on in. So they just got here from Joey Royal's Pizza Party. Okay, I'm taking a guess that's a live stream. Nice, very nice. Matthew Blackwell says, the new generation is all about instant gratification. Old, I want to say it was Carrie Fisher who said this. I might be wrong. I might be attributing it to the wrong person. But if I remember right, Carrie Fisher said, the only thing wrong with instant gratification is it takes too long. Flaming Aaron says, these days people don't even have to buy the books. People are willing to share their copies. Or they're willing to share scanned copies. That is certainly it. Doom Colonist says, Jeff's not wrong. It is alarming how many folks are floating around today with an inflated idea of their own importance. Yeah. And, you know... I'll be the first to admit, when I grew up, my parents were not my friends. They were my parents. And there was some fear involved. So, Elliot will attest that we got up to some shenanigans in our youth. And sometimes in our adult life, too. <laughs> but one of the things that would keep you in line mainly was... I don't want to get it from my parents. Oh, my God. It's like, if my dad found out that we did this, I would be in deep shit. Nowadays, it's parents are like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm my kid's friend. I mean, I'm not necessarily saying that that shouldn't be the case. Because for one, I'm not a parent. I can't tell anybody how to parentally guide their children. But I do see that there, there's just a, a lot of folks out there that have somehow gotten the misconception that the world gives a shit about them. And thankfully, I grew up and my parents pretty much drove it into me that yeah, the reality is, it is a cruel world, and the world really doesn't care. And be thankful for the people in your life who do care about you. And don't take them for granted, and don't take opportunities that happen for you for granted. Where nowadays just doesn't, doesn't seem to be that way. And you know, I am... I know some people are probably thinking the next thing I'm going to yell is, get off my lawn! But I'm not. Okay. Uh, Kevin R. Smith says, to be fair, before the internet, being kicked out of one of the D&D group, out of the one D&D group in your town or neighborhood, could kick you out of the hobby effectively. True. Very true. Especially if you lived in a small town. You may not even have a game group. I've heard stories of people in the 80s uh, late 70s, who heard of this Dungeons and Dragons thing and they wanted to get on board, but there wasn't any place within 200 miles that they were going to find it. So, Rogue Thinker says, Yeah, I usually make and eat dinner during the first hour of your stream. Glad I make it for a bit, though. Thanks and hello, Jeff. Hello, Rogue Thinker. Thank you. I appreciate everyone who tunes in and watches this show. I really do. And uh, as I mentioned last night, if you didn't catch last night's episode, uh, a friend of mine, although the reality is I haven't talked to him in about 25 years, but for 18 years, he was a super close friend. He also happens to be my best friend, Elliot's nephew, uh, is in hospice and does not have much time. And it has been wearing on me, along with the bullshit with the scammer in my dad's checking account. 
And I really do appreciate, I'm not asking you for, oh, Jeff, oh, my heart goes, I'm not asking for that. I'm just saying it really does help to be able to, you know, take some time out and chat with folks who, their words on a black screen. And it, it really does. Uh, I enjoy doing this. Because I'll tell you what, if I didn't, I certainly would not be doing this for 300 views. Most of these shows get. <laughs> All right. So Chris Lundgren's clocking on out. Good to see you. I'm going to wrap this up myself. Uh, sorry if we really didn't cover the topic like you thought we would. But... Uh, I mean, I, like I said, no one's going to be an expert on this because no one has been around the entire gaming community forever and been everywhere and seen how people are treated everywhere. I guarantee like people like Mike Pondsmith, Chris Spivey, they can tell us probably some horrifying stories about this hobby and uh, individuals who tried to keep them out of the publishing business and just out of the hobby itself. I. I guarantee that. I do not doubt that. And when I started talking about this topic, I'm going to bring this up once again. I am not claiming that people who say that they have been gatekept or lying or anything like that. I believe them. I just think it's far more prevalent now with the way society is fractured in so many different ways and how unwilling people are to compromise, I think we see more of it going on now than ever before. Plus, I also have to point out that I think, as sickening as this is, that people are far, far less afraid to share their racist views and bullshit like that than ever before, which is not only sickening, it's pretty fucking scary, too. All righty. So, so Carolyn says, no, that was pretty much what I was expecting. So thankfully, Carolyn set the bar low for tonight's topic. So he was not disappointed. <laughs> All righty then. As I mentioned, tomorrow I will share why you do not mess with me. And I'm if if you know it's not gaming related. So I will certainly understand if people don't tune in or if they watch maybe the news and then leave. Completely get it. Completely get it. Perkins Dearborn says the fractures are deeper and less tolerated today than just a few years ago. Yeah. Six, seven years ago, completely different country, really. All righty. So if you were watching live, thank you very much. If you watch live and took part in chat, big tip of the cap, because you're not only keeping me company, you're keeping each other company as well. But of course, I know a lot of you out there, you don't have an opportunity to watch live. doesn't matter if you're watching live or on Memorex. Thank you very much for taking time out to watch any of these videos. Now, of course, be sure to... Give a thumbs up to the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, don't forget, ring that bell. It'll not only let you know when the dispatch streams live, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. Central. It'll also let you know when I share other videos, such as my upcoming first look at... Ooh, who, who released this? <laughs> Jewel of the Indigo Isles. From Roll for Combat, part of their Battle Zoo lineup for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. The video is shot. It is in the can. It is just not edited. So I guess it's not really in the can. But that will be later on this week. I've got some other videos that will be hitting as well. Everybody enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time of day it is in your neck of the woods. I will be back tomorrow. And as always, I'm Jeff McAleer, and here's hoping each and every one of you gets to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang.